Hi all, I have another great game recommendation by Oisev Onos. So he recommended this game at the King's Crusher TV slash Discord uh, chat in the game suggestions form there. If you want to come there and make your own game suggestions, you're welcome to. So this also ties in with a Cora question I've been checking out recently, which I may answer soon. Uh, what should every chess player know about the birds opening? So this particular example game is Lasker against birds. So Lasker playing with the black pieces against birds in a special match that they played in 1892. It was played in Newcastle upon Tyne uh, from August 29th to September the 2nd. So the winner of the match would be the first to win five games with draws not counting. Time, the time limit was 20 moves per hour. The match stake was £50, which in those days was quite a lot. It would be about £5,000 or more now nowadays. So Bird kicked off with the birds opening so he popularized this hugely as as well as the um the birds defense in the royal Lopez. in case you don't know his other uh legacy you know e4 e5 knight f3 knight c6 bishop b5 to play knight d4 here that's the birds defense in the royal Lopez. but here the bird bird is playing the birds opening with f4 and we have a critical test by emmanuel lasca here the from's gambit so a very aggressive gambit with the black pieces, trying to open up lines, you know, may, maybe show the sensitivity of these diagonals, uh, give black fierce piece pressure. We have F takes. It is one of the sounder gambits in chess with the black pieces. So D6, E takes, Bishop takes D6, and already black has a killer threat that white needs to be aware of. So this is a must, you must know this, uh, if you play a move like knight c3, for example, then you're going to be checkmated because of queen h4 check. This critical diagonal here, either queen takes or bishop takes, leads to a quick checkmate. So you must guard against that somehow. And uh, we have here knight f3 guarding the h4 square. And now a very aggressive move, which is still very, very popular today, g5, just trying to dislodge this knight and again renew this queen h4 idea. Here in this game, Henry Edward Bird actually played d4. The modern preference is g3, and I believe white's actually getting uh, an edge here myself. There's this player called Black Croman, who's a big bird enthusiast, and also got me into the uh, the tango variation with the black piece, which I play quite a lot. But he's a big enthusiast with the birds opening, black croman. And this kind of position, for example, here, white can aim to castle queenside, basically. So c3 and e4 and bishop g2. And basically, you can try and castle eventually on the queen side, And it should be a pretty pleasant position, at least equal. So that's a great way of playing it, I believe. But here we see um, d4 from Henry Bird. And in fact, Lasker plays g4, and after knight e5, it gives black the option of now doubling white's pawns and dislodging the king, and Lasker takes up that opportunity. So black already has significant compensation. Uh, this pawn is pretty vulnerable uh, to attack. It looks like, you know, a Budapest strategy, you know, for example, like this later, even if White's going to defend like that, this pawn is also subject to frontal attack. And you can see that it's kind of fragmented White's pawn structure as well. Black has more compact islands of pawns, uh, if you look at the three and three over here, compared to the two, one and three. So after Bishop F4, I believe Black's got great compensation here. Bishop E6, E3. Uh, here, maybe better, in fact, was actually king c1, and if here, then e4. Maybe this is this is a slightly better way to play it. But we have e3, and now knight g e7. Bishop b5. We have black castling with check. Okay, king c1. Bishop d5 is played. Rook g1. a6. Bishop e2. Bishop e6, and now knight c3. And here, uh, in, in view of bishop g5 potentially, on knight g5 and bishop f6, 
Uh, Lesker plays a move which closes off the g5 square, so he's making knight g6 a little bit more effective without bishop g5, it seems, at one level anyway. So h6, a kind of high class preparation move. Uh, we have bishop d3 as if to say, well, I'm, I'm going to snap off uh, this knight if it dares go to g6 to try and recollect the pawn. Uh, here, perhaps though, a better choice is knight e4, and after knight g6, just 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 saying, you know, take the pawn with knight c5, and if knight takes, you know, white getting that light square bishop with the bishop pair here, this should be uh, technically even, and in fact, uh, both sides share the free uh, pawn islands here. You can see they've both got that uh, isolated pawn in the center. But why it's got that bishop pair, it should be about even. But we see maybe a slightly controversial decision, uh, bishop d3 here, uh, because now after knight g6, white is uh, volunteering uh, the light square bishop just to hold on to a pawn. Uh, so here, this bishop now is much more significant than usual without the counterpart. I would say that, in fact, the light squares like g2, in general, the light squares of white's position have been, you know, in theory, compromised because of this, you know, monster on the light squares, which has no counterpart, uh, potential monster. So, you know, rook d1, we have rook d8, e4, and, and the other asset black has, which Lasker is showing, is, is this pawn mass over here. Even though these two pawns are doubled, uh, there could be trouble ahead here because they can be pushed quite aggressively and maybe a pawn sack can be used. So this is quite a dangerous mass of pawns potentially. Rook h f8, b3, and now h5. Yes, this this looks like it's pushing uh, the white bishop here into a passive position potentially. Rook d2, h4, uh, bishop f2, and black recollects the pawn, and black does seem to be just fully in the driving seat already. It's a horrible isolated pawn uh, and a horrible blockade square. It's a very, very comfortable blockading knight on e5. So already it seems, you know, white's in big, big trouble here, even at just move 24. So move 24, bishop e3 was played, and here we have h3. Uh, this is a very, very interesting. Uh, pawn sacrifice, which guarantees a superbly strong passed pawn after bishop takes g5 is played. Uh, there's very little uh, to, for white to do already, because if g3, then knight f3, and if here, bishop d7, and black is actually clearly uh, better, for example, like this. Uh, black's just doing really well here. That Isolated e pawn the knight entrenched on f3 it's horrible. So anyway, white played bishop, you know, taking that pawn. But now, guess what? Laska plays in this position, and it is a rather positionally crushing continuation now. So what would you play with the black pieces? If I give you ten seconds to pause the video. Okay. Laska creates a really, really dangerous pass pawn with this g3. We have h takes and check. But before we get into h takes, hold on a sec. If g takes, then that weakens f3. White can go into f3. Sorry, black can go into f3 and you know either take the bishop or even take here to threaten to queen. And then take in there. This is just devastating stuff. Uh, you know, it's absolutely winning for black. So uh, h takes was played, but now we have check and taking, and now h2 threatening to queen, and a whole rook is now tied up after knight g4. The threat is now knight f2, so the rook has to kind of defend against that with rook h1 to say like knight f2, rook takes h2. Uh, so this is horrendous, but how does black actually build up the pressure here? Well. It's this pawn, it's on, sitting on a light square, and we've got the, the light square bishop, which just reroutes here, bishop f7, to really hammer this pawn from g6. And then after that, you know, g2 could be a target potentially. We have uh, king b2, c6. Uh, maybe 
you know this is more accurate c6 to prevent any knight d5 because if bishop g6 knight d5 uh, here there is the possibility of knight f6 for example and that is actually going to be difficult for, for black to win with the opposite color bishops so c6 cutting out any stuff like that and this is the victim in the position this pawn because uh, the rook's really just locked out so black is essentially in a way material up here being able to build up pressure easily on the poor e pawn the king is just not in time and here guess what Lasker plays actually which is a pretty emphatic celebration of this light square bishop without the counterpart and you can see that you know these are all on light squares so that's a clue on what Lasker actually played if I give you 10 seconds here what would you play okay an emphatic rook takes e4 it turns out this is not even needed uh, bishop takes e4 is also strong because this position uh, it's just really tied up you know white whites uh, just much worse here but this is really quite emphatic this exchange sack uh, knight d1 white dare not take that if knight takes this monster on the light squares uh, what can white do about g2 you know without the counterpart all the light squares are dropping and material is being won there so uh knight d1 but we have now the forcing rook d4 check and guess what Laska plays here it's really crunch time black to play here before white has any time to get organized rook takes d1 yeah now rook takes d1 is played because if king takes then there's knight f2 check and taking on h1 so rook takes d1 but this light square bishop is a monster bishop e4 so threatening bishop takes g2 the king can't get away because of the queening uh so we have check uh rook d1 bishop takes g2 Bird plays a final trick. Harry Bird plays a final trick. Check. Uh, and then Bishop B6. So it will be unwise to Queen here because of Rook D8 checkmate. <laughs> so in fact, Bishop D5 avoids that little trap. Yeah, just put that on the board. Queening is a bad idea. There is a killer common square Rook D8 checkmate. So Bishop D5 disconnects the Rook from D8 and still the, the pawn is Queening. So c4 queening, black's a whole bishop up now, and Henry Bird resigned. Uh, the staggering thing about this game, if you check with a computer for accuracy, Henry Bird actually uh, four inaccuracies, one mistake, zero blunders, uh, 15 average center pawn loss, and Alaska, Alaska had three inaccuracies, zero mistakes, zero blunders, nine average center pawn loss. A super accurate gambit display, the Fromm's Gambit, one of the soundest gambits, in fact, that you can play with the black pieces. But with such immense accuracy, uh, you know, to this day. This was played in 1892, this game. So Lasker seems to be very, very accurate player, far ahead of his time in terms of pure, you know, technical accuracy, in fact. Uh, some have said Capablanca is like one of the more accurate world champions. But yeah, there's a lot of these Lasker games when he's in that mood for a more solid uh, sort of game. He can play super accurately as well. And that's, I guess, one of the reasons why he was the longest reigning world chess champions. He's just underrepresented on YouTube. So that's why I thought I'd, I'd try and keep this series going. I hope you enjoyed this game, got something out of it. Uh, we saw here a demonstration of a pawn mass being able to break through with a pawn mass even if there's a double pawn there to create a dangerous outside pass pawn we saw the island effect how a dangerous uh, central um, isolated pawn can be victimized later we saw how the the light square bishop without a counterpart can be made into a real killer weapon here with this exchange sack 
and then it's en route to smashing up G2 and supporting H1 queening. So I thought pretty instructive chess. And we also see how the evolution of the birds opening this, even though bird was playing it himself later, yeah, it became more sophisticated with the knight f3, g3 variations, which do actually give white to me a small advantage actually. If you know what you're doing with the birds opening against the Fromm's Gambit, it should guarantee you a small advantage in my view. But please let me know if you disagree with that or any other stuff. Yeah, make the comments more lively for sure. You're welcome to a question and comment. Uh, if you want to check out my playlists, uh, bitly slash leader chess, bitly slash dropfish chess. Um, if you want to challenge me for a game, kingscrusher.tv. If you register there, I'll be able to invite you for a game or bitly slash chess world. Okay, comments, questions, like, share, subscribes with the notification bell. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much.